This is Today with Kino Kamis on Cape Talk. And it is time for Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist. Chris, good morning. Morning, Kino. So as we wait for people to call in and ask you phenomenal questions about all sorts of interesting things, I thought it's quite fitting, though, given the fact that we've got the global climate strike and that there are some presidents in this world that believe, um, you know, that science is all pseudoscience. Um, What science is there in favour of global warming? Do you know, my mind was really focused this week because about two or three days ago, I spoke to a chap in the US at Cornell University called Ken Rosenberg. He studies birds and their habitats. And he published this paper in Science. It's out this week, one of the world's most important science journals. And he opened his conversation with me by saying, there has been a dramatic decline in bird populations in our study area in North America in the last 30 or 40 years. And when he says dramatic decline, I then obviously came back and said, well, how big's dramatic? And he said, about a third of the bird population of North America has disappeared. Actually, he put some numbers on it. How many does that translate into? The answer is a staggering 3 billion birds, fewer now than in 1970. So then you ask the question, well, why is that? And the answer is, it's because of habitat destruction. And as human populations rise, as we make our mark on the countryside, we rob the environment away from the animals that naturally live there and are adapted to live there and have evolved to live in these places over millions of years, they have nowhere to go. So not surprisingly, that pressure is brought to bear on them and their populations dwindle. Now, we think that climate change is an issue for us, but we are just one of many thousands of species on Earth. And... If we think it's bad for us, think about the other animals and species that if we change the environment and we continue to change the environment are going to suffer in the same way as these birds are. And he puts it that, you know, these birds are a canary in the coal mine for what's happening, not just in North America, but everywhere. Because his argument is, well, actually, you know, we've got very good data for North America, so we we can demonstrate objectively this is happening. And they've done it using surveys. They've even used weather radar to make these measurements because you can see on the radar pictures migrating birds. You can pick them up so you can objectively measure how many birds are migrating. And so that's why they know their numbers are reliable. The same thing, he argues, is happening in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, across Asia, and not just to birds, across the range of species. So we do have to take our stewardship of this planet very carefully, and that includes being being careful custodians of the climate too. I had a, a colleague of mine, I won't mention any names, who said to me, but I know I should care about it, but I can't find myself to actually care about it enough to actually do something. And that is our challenge, isn't it? Well, I think also technology has to, to rise to meet the challenge. We have to come up with ways to use our energy more carefully, better stewardship of the energy and resources we have. We've been yeah. very profligate with, with, our, with our environmental access to resources and so on in the past. We, ha- we have to be more cautious and more careful and, and be more cognizant of the impact that we as, as a race have across our planet and, and also look at how many there are of us because any species that massively outstrips its food supply which we have, which massively outstrips its supply of energy, which we have, which massively outstrips its supply of resources, which we have, is in trouble. You know, history tells us that. And so we need to look at uh, curtailing human population growth so we can try and keep this within sustainable limits because it's one thing to build technologies to stop the problem getting worse. But if we don't keep on... Uh, or we don't rein in our population growth, then we're just going to make more of a rob to beat our own backs with in the future because we're going to have to invent even more science and more technologies to solve even more problems that don't exist yet, but we will make them exist if we keep on doing what we're doing. Jonathan in Musenberg with two questions, I believe. Hi there, Jonathan. Good morning. Morning, morning, morning. Hi, Chris. Uh, Jonathan speaking. Listen, um, you're, you're, some time ago you told us that when you fly flying down, when you don't think faster, but that is actually incorrect, and I'll tell you why. It is because of wind gradient. Now, when you fly downwind, uh, Ben Willie's principle is that with an increase in velocity, there's a decrease in static pressure. Now, in in wind gradient, you also get wind micro gradient. When you fly downwind, the increase in velocity is inhibited by the the wind the molecules that are are pushing the wind from behind and almost negating the lift effect. Now, that is the reason that you actually think faster when you fly downwind. And I've done a lot of experiments uh, over a period of two years. 
I was a hang glider pilot in 1977, and um, there were a number of people, Corey Fenton, Raymond Holland, and a number of other people. And um, we all we, we worked on this, and basically, when you fly downwind, you do sink faster than when you fly into wind. Now, and if you if you take a, a an airfoil section and you look at the um, and you draw a vertical line which represent a, a line, and then you draw lines which represent the velocity of molecules, and then and you'll see that the, and you and you do the same for the representation of the wind microgradient. You'll see that when you're flying into wind, the molecules that are flying on the height of the top of the wing are traveling faster than the, the lower lower ones. When you turn the, the, the wing around, the cross section around, you'll see that the, the, the wind blowing from the center, the, the in front of the wing is actually uh, diminishing the, the, the increase in velocity that the airfoil should be experiencing. That is why you actually sink faster when you fly downward. My second question is about blood pressure. If blood pressure, if, if pressure is too much blood in the body, can't, can't it be helped if you have a, a um, give a blood donation and you remove some bl- blood from your body. First of all, the wing thing, the way a wing works is that you are using Newton's laws, Newton's third law specifically, which is for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you push air downwards, air pushes you upwards with an equal and opposite force. So the action of a wing is to move air downwards and that way if you move air downwards it moves you upwards and that's how you generate lift. Um, in terms of blood pressure, then th- this is actually quite correct, that uh, if you have a high volume of fluid in a blood vessel, it's going to stretch the blood vessel more, therefore the pressure is higher. If you reduce the volume of fluid in the vessel, the wall pressure is lower, blood pressure is lower. And this is actually part of the action of one way in which we treat blood pressure, which is to use diuretics. These are molecules which encourage water loss, salt and water loss from the body, reducing the circulating volume. And this actually means that the load on the heart is reduced, therefore the heart works less hard. And if it works less hard, it's putting less blood into the blood vessel, so the pressure drops. So you're quite right, actually, if we reduce circulating volume, you do actually reduce blood pressure. And in the old days, when people used to do blood letting, it's certainly very bad to hemorrhage lots of blood, but probably... In some cases, there was a therapeutic benefit through doing that. I mean, admittedly, you're losing your blood, which is not good in the long run. But in the short term, it probably did have the effect of reducing some of the circulating volume and therefore dropping blood pressure in people who had certain problems like heart failure, for example. It would have had a short-term benefit for them. Well, thank you very much for that question or those questions, Jonathan. You're listening to the naked scientist, Chris Smith. Any science questions, science-related questions that you have, shoot. And let's see if he can answer them. He's got about a, what, 99.999 strike rate? Not too bad. I mean, if you were a cricketer, you'd be Joe Root or something like that. Um, let's, go to, let's go to Barris in Bloberg. Hi, Barris. Good morning, morning, morning. Um, yeah, just a, a question. A friend of mine tried to melt some Vaseline in the microwave, and it wouldn't work, and I thought he was joking. And I tried it as well. I put a nice blob of Vaseline, put it in the microwave, a normal standard microwave, mm. and I could not get it to melt. But if I took it out and put it on a stove in a frying pan, then it melted. Ah, so okay. Is there any logical reason why the mother the vaseline wouldn't melt? Well, that's an interesting one, Chris. Never been asked that one before, but we can certainly speculate. Uh, a really interesting experiment to do is to take an equal volume of water, freeze one of the vessels of water, and keep the other one liquid. Then put the ice and the water, their identical amounts of water, remember, in the microwave together, and see which one boils first. And you'll see that the water boils way before the ice has even begun melting and the reason for this is because of the way a microwave oven works microwave ovens actually are using a frequency of electromagnetic radiation microwaves which are chosen purposefully to make water molecules vibrate and when i say vibrate it makes the molecules because the molecules are a shape a bit like a boomerang with the hydrogens where the arms of the boomerang are and the oxygen where the apex of the boomerang is and the hydrogens are slightly positive and the oxygens are slightly negative because of the oxygen's hunger for electrons and this means that when the water molecules see the microwaves coming past them they try to flip backwards and forwards in the same way that the microwaves are going up and down shaking and that shaking is a bit like you rubbing your hands together about uh, 2.45 billion times a second, which is the frequency of the microwaves, and that generates heat. So anything that's got water molecules in it that can be made to vibrate will become warm in the microwave. Certain things which contain 
more water than others will therefore absorb water absorb energy faster than others and that's why ice which has got the water molecules in a configuration where they can't vibrate around and absorb the energy very well does not pick up energy fast and liquid water does now your vaseline is petroleum jelly these are long chains of carbon atoms a hydrocarbon carbon with hydrogen sticking off the side there's very little water in vaseline and for that reason there's very little uh, molecules with the configuration and the electrical structure that wants to vibrate in response to a microwave going past and therefore the vaseline absorbs energy from a microwave only very slowly but when you put it in the hot pan because the Vaseline is just soaking up energy which is being radiated and conducted by the pan surface, then it gets hot no problem and it melts. Well, thank you for that, Chris, and thank you very much for the question there, Barris, in Bloberg Strand. Another one in from Mariana. The Cape Sugarbird visits my garden daily. The male has a bright red band on his chest and a metallic emerald green covering his head, chest, back and wings. What gives the feathers that metallic sheen from Mariana? There's a number of ways that you can achieve a colour in nature. If you look at some flowers, what you find in those flowers is that the flowers make chemicals that impart colour to the petals. And a, a rose is a good example of that. You And, and a beetroot, for example, the, the when you make a beetroot, when you, when you cut beetroots bright red, those are molecules, anthocyanins in this case, that give colour. Another way to create colour is what's called structural colour. And you'll see this in things like insects, butterflies with beautifully iridescent wings. They haven't got pigments being added. They've actually used the structure of the surface of their wings to interfere with light in a very specific way so that certain colours of light are reflected and others are absorbed. And this is very similar with the way birds' feathers do this. You make a certain configuration of scales in the feather components so that when light remember white light is a mixture of all the different colors of the rainbow and those different colors are waves of different sizes different wavelengths and by changing the structure of the surfaces on the wings then when these light waves of different sizes hit those surfaces some of the colors will actually interact with the surface and be absorbed into the feather body others will be reflected off and as they're reflected off they can interfere with the light that's coming in and by interfere what we mean is that different light waves add together to make hot bright spots and, and dark spots and the effect is very similar to when you put oil on the surface of water and what happens when you put oil on the surface of water and see a rainbow is that the oil spreads out as a thin layer on the water surface in some places it's very thin as a layer in other places it's thicker and because the light is going through different thicknesses of oil and bouncing off of the surface where the oil meets the water, some of the light waves have travelled a different distance to others, and this means that they, their wave phase is slightly different to the incoming light, so they can cancel out light of some colours in some places, not in others, which is why you see the rainbow effect. The birds, butterflies, other insects that make these nice colours, and some plants, there are some plants that make very strange colours, uh, they also do the same thing. Uh, morning, Naked Scientist. If the Earth is spinning at a 1,000 miles an hour, how do pilots manage to adjust the accuracy of their landings if you're flying east to west, north to south? Well, yes, it does sound like that should be a problem because at the equator, the Earth is spinning around. It's doing more than a 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. But you've got to remember that planes are flying because they're flying in the air. The air is the fluid that surrounds the planet. And as that fluid goes over the wings, as we heard at the beginning of this programme, it creates lift and that's what keeps your air aircraft aloft. But because the Earth is spinning round, it's pulling around with it in the same direction of, of travel, the air that surrounds the Earth. In the same way that if I dip my hand into my bath water and I swirl my hand round in a circle, before long all of the water in the bath starts going round in a big vortex in the same direction as I'm turning my hand. The air around the earth is doing the same thing and it's doing it predictably at roughly the same speed. And so that means that actually relative to the earth, the air isn't moving and therefore the thing that's supporting you isn't moving. So actually you've not got a problem. David in Newlands, good morning. Hi, good morning. My children always laugh at this because they think just I'm getting old. But in the morning when I wake up, my nose dribbles. And I, uh, somebody told me that my brain was getting rid of excess fluid. Can, can you tell me what, what is happening to me? I don't have a cold or anything like that. 
A dribbly nose. Uh, yeah. I take the dogs for a walk and nothing happens. OK. Hi, David. Well, when you go to sleep at night, all of your secretions dry up. This includes saliva, it includes tears, and it also includes the secretions in your nose that make snot. And the reason we do this is purely because when we go to sleep at night, your rate of breathing slows down. You're not, you, you're not actually needing to produce lots of tears because your eyes are closed. You don't need to produce all that saliva because your mouth is hopefully closed unless you're a big snorer. So the body, to prevent you choking on all your own secretions and being disturbed through the night having to wake up and cough and so on, it cuts down the rate at which you produce all these secretions. When you first wake up in the morning, you then have to activate everything again. And that's why some people have got slightly sticky eyes and then they activate their tear film and everything gets a bit runnier. Uh, same in the nose, you start to produce um, a higher blood flow to the nose lining, which is there to warm the air coming in and produce these secretions. Same with your saliva. So I suspect the slightly runny nose in the morning is because everything's been non-runny at night. And part of the getting up and waking up process, you've got some, some drying of the airways, which produces a little bit of minor irritation which then provokes enhanced secretion from the nose in order to clear that when you first wake up. That would be my speculation anyway. Bruce asks, and uh, is this why your breath is so smelly in the morning? Because things have dried up and not rinsed away. Your that, mouth, that's your absolutely mouth, the case. You produce saliva, and saliva has a, a range of effects. One of them is it has a lubricant effect, which helps to get food down. If you didn't have saliva there, it would be very uncomfortable swallowing a piece of crusty bread, for example. But saliva is replete with a whole panoply of antibodies, and these antibodies are called IgA antibodies, and they have a very powerful suppressive effect on microorganisms, and they're there to protect you and to maintain the correct balance of microbes in the oral cavity. When you go to bed at night, you do two things. One, as we've just discussed, turn off your saliva flow or turn it right down so your mouth does dry out. So the suppressive effect of the microbes goes down. And also, because you're moving your mouth around a lot less, you're swallowing a lot less, you increase the proportions of different bacteria that are there. So they're not being suppressed with uh, antibodies. They're not being washed away by swallowing, moving your tongue around your teeth. And as a result, you get an overgrowth of microbes, including some quite smelly ones, which are tend to be anaerobic. They're, they don't like oxygen because they hide in all of the gunky bits and the tartar and the, and the bits where oxygen doesn't get to very well in the oral cavity. And they produce smelly molecules, which tend to build up until you wash them away by cleaning your teeth in the morning. This is today. I'm Kino Cummings with you until midday, and you are joined by the naked scientist Chris Smith. Let's go to Theo in Paul. Hi there, Theo. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning. I'll be quick. I travelled regularly from Paul to Port Elizabeth up the up the Garden Route. I drive the same car in Paul. I fill in my I fill up my car when I get to Philly. There's about quarter of the tank left. And when I come back, I fill up my car again, and I barely reach fall. And it happened a couple of times. I drive the same route, uh, everything at the same speed and everything. So I can't see why there should be okay. quite a vast difference in petrol consumption. So why is your petrol usage different driving from Paul to Port Elizabeth than from Port Elizabeth to Paul? Chris? You have to ask the question... Why Why does a car need fuel? The fuel is doing the job of providing energy so the car can go along, of course. And as the car is going along, it's doing work against two things. One, it's doing work against air resistance. You're pushing a car-sized blob of air out of the way in front of your car all the time. So basically, you've got to add up the mass of all the molecules of air you're moving, and that's how much mass you're moving out of the way so your car can go along. So therefore, the more air that's in the way of your car the more fuel you're going to burn. So if you're fighting against the wind or the pressure is higher, then you're going to do more work and you're going to burn more fuel. That's the first point. So which is the direction of the prevailing wind? That's what I would like to know. The other is, of course, that when you drive your car uphill, you're doing work against gravity, which is trying to accelerate your car downhill. So if you're doing work, you're going to need more energy. So you will burn more fuel climbing a hill than when you're coasting down the hill the other way. So also we need to look at the relative altitudes covered or heights covered. Is there a net gain in altitude in one direction versus the other? So those are the two things to consider. And as long as your driving behaviour is is directly the same between the two the traffic you encounter the amount of stops and starts and so on is the same if all other things are equal it has to be those two factors which are the only the only two things that can really make a difference